Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that we were given this opportunity to hear the Gospels. We are blessed because of your gospel. Inspire our minds, illuminate our dull hearts, that we may know the truth and the truth truly set us free. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This portion of gospel is very interesting. First, it is written in such a way any dramatist would like to picturize it. Any student of literature will admire the way it's stitched together. When we read it just like that, we miss all the salient points. All we remember is a sick child and a sick woman. In fact, that would be the title of the sermon. A dying child and a dying woman in Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> Mark records this incident in detail because you must know Mark was not there when this thing happened and it was his uncle, mother's brother Peter was there so Peter told him this and this gospel was written in Alexandria in Egypt and the first gospel to be written and one of the first stories to be written so it's a very interesting one Mark was an educated person, so he could put it in the Greek thought how this should become as a gospel. The story of the two ladies, one young, one old. One is dying on her bed, the other one is dying. Both are facing death. The child is dying and the father is in desperation. The woman is dying and she is in desperation. If you are in desperation this morning, this is a good story for you. An encouraging story for you. The key word is desperation. We all face desperation at certain points in our life. Whether it's health, whether it's employment, whether it's finance, whether it's relationship, we face desperations. When I was a child, I felt desperation because of my capital. When I was in the university, I felt desperation because I paid once. You know, we face desperation. We lose jobs. We fail at relationship. So this is a story of encouragement for those who are in desperation. And very interesting, the father of Jairus, uh, the father of the child, Jairus, he comes and tells Jesus, come and touch my daughter. He wants a daughter, he wants Jesus to touch him. The daughter. He, Jairus wants Jesus to touch the daughter. But here a dying woman says, I will touch Jesus. The point is, you have to judge, you have to touch Jesus. You don't touch Jesus, you are not going to get healed, going to be saved. So you must touch Jesus. How do you touch Jesus? The lady gave the secret. She said, I will go and touch his garments. I will approach him. How do we approach now Jesus Christ? Through our prayers. You talk to him, you pray. And he is there. And if you can get a partner to pray with you. Because Jesus said if you have two or three or more than that. If you come with one accord and one mind and you pray, I'll be with you. The key is two people with one accord, one ambition, one mind, one will. You come, the Lord will be with you. Jesus uh, sorry, Jairus fell at the feet of Jesus after coming before him. You know, there was a big crowd and people find it difficult to come to Jesus because he was the leader of the synagogue. He is a man, prominent man. 
people gave way for him to come to Jesus. And he fell at the feet of Jesus, pleading for Jesus to come and touch his daughter. This dying woman fell at the feet of Jesus after she got healed. Whether you are in need or your need has been fulfilled, you must be at the feet of Jesus. That's a very interesting Tamil hymn which says, Atma Nesarin Malar Educate Saranam. If you have been Tamil educated, you will know. There's a song that says, I surrender at the feet of the lover of my soul. So that's what they did. Jairus fell at the feet of Jesus, imploring Jesus to help him. The woman fell at his feet in fear. So you must understand that you can plead for God's mercy, but you must have fear of God. Fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Wisdom, brother. Sophia, wisdom. Jesus commented the woman for her great faith. The Greek word used is pistio. Sorry, pistis. Pistis. P-I-S-T-I-S. Pistis. That's the Greek word. And Jesus exhorted Jairus when he heard the daughter had died, had faith. And that word is pistio. Pistis, pistio. Both Greek words have the same root, pist means a faith with hope, or rather a faith with assurance of hope. You, you have hope, but this hope is assured. That means you'll be fulfilled. So that is the word that Mark uses for it. Jairus' daughter was called the little girl by Jesus. Say little girl. You remember, he told her, hold her hand and said, little girl, Talit. He called the woman daughter. Jesus is our father. He is our friend. He is our elder. He is our kinsman. So these words teach us, though in this story, both were men and uh, women, <clears throat> but it also applies to men. We are his sons. We are his sons. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 12 says, Those who believe in the name of Jesus Christ, to them God gave the authority to become the children of God. We are sons and daughters here. The woman was afflicted for 12 years. The woman was afflicted for how many years? And Mark kept the age of the little girl till the end. He never revealed her. At last he says, the girl was 12 years old. See the combination, how he brings in. 12 years affliction, the little girl was 12 years old. The plea of Jairus to Jesus was assertive. That he knew Jesus can help him. He was confident that Jesus is powerful. He knew that Jesus will do that miracle. So his faith was assertive. He acted on the faith boldly. The woman, on the other hand, had a humble plea. She said, I dare not go before him. I will not even look at his face. All I know is to catch hold of his robes. That's enough for me. Assertive faith, a humble faith. It doesn't matter what faith you have, God will touch you. He will heal you. It doesn't matter. Some people have great faith. Some people have little faith. That is what Jesus said. If you have faith as the size of a mustard seed, and you tell this mountain to move from here and go into the sea, it will be so. 
It is, doesn't mean that nature of your faith or the size of your faith, but the faith itself. Do you have faith itself? If you have faith in itself, that is good enough. It doesn't matter whether you have 100% whether you have 1%. As long as you have faith, you will live. Both facets of faith are contrasted. Both pleas were heard and answered. Now in conclusion, I'm going to give you certain things and then I'll give you how you apply in your life. Jesus, the word of Jesus works has spread such that desperate Jairus immediately fell at his feet. You remember the beginning of the story. Eh? It said eh, Jesus left the other side of the lake and came over to this side. He left the north side of the lake and came north east and came to southwest. Okay, that is geographical position. What happened in northeast was a man was in the tombs. He would not be even controlled by chains. God had healed him. Do you not remember Jesus healed him? But those people told him to go away. Go away. Please go away. Don't come to us. They saw a great miracle. Didn't appreciate it. There are many sick people. They didn't believe it. They didn't want him. Many of us are sometimes like that. You know, Christians. We have heard, had experiences of miracles in our lives. Yet we abandon Christ. Many times God has done great things for us. We did not consider it. He had come over this side, the southwest. And there, the people were mostly Jewish people. And they have heard about Jesus Christ. On the other side, it was not Jewish people. They are Gentiles. And that is why Isaiah was fulfilled. Because somebody asked me, when did the Gentiles reject Jesus? Because Isaiah 53 says you'll be, <coughs> you'll be rejected by men. So both Jew and Gentile may reject. He was rejected at the northeast of the lake. Where he has did a miracle, they didn't want him. And that is the place where the 2,000 pigs went into the sea and died. So wherever you hear the word pig, you know Gentiles are there. I went to Israel. There's only one place in on the northern Israel on the way to Nazareth. The Jewish people have a pig farm. They export lard and pig, uh, pork to Germany. They say the pigs are placed on a wooden floor, you know. They raise the floor, wooden floor, and only Gentiles, the mostly Arab Christians, are employed to do the job. They will not touch, but they will make the money out of it. That is why people say, don't be a Jew when you are only thinking of money. So, Gentiles rejected him. Here, the Jewish people accepted him. Later on in life, the Jewish people rejected him. The Gentiles accepted him. That's why you and I are sitting here. Alright? Jairus was the leader of the synagogue. That is the church of the Jewish people. They had a temple. Once a year they have to go. But in their local communities, they have a synagogue. They have a leader. They will read the Torah. They will explain. And the whole Jewish life depended upon the Torah and the synagogue. And he was a leader. And his daughter was dying. And he has heard about Jesus. Maybe he believed Isaiah Therefore, he comes boldly into the presence of Jesus Christ. And because there was a great crowd, because Jairus was an important person, he had access to Jesus immediately. We being Christians, we have immediate access to Jesus Christ. 
we don't make use of it. We are very, very blessed to know the Lord, at least to know about the Lord. But we are reluctant to know the Lord, but not Jairus. He had heard about him, like we have heard about Jesus. He came to Jesus to know him. Can you come to Jesus to know him? You have to know a person. We all know about Anwar Ibrahim, our Prime Minister. How many of you know him? I don't know him. I know about him. I know he was charged this. He went through this and all that I know. He got a wife, he got a daughter. Now he's a Prime Minister. He's an eloquent speaker. That's all I know about him. But I don't know him personally. Neither does he know me. But Christians cannot be like that. We have to know Jesus. How do you know Jesus? Through this. Bible is the source of knowing Jesus. It gives the history. It gives his character. It gives you his mind, his heart, his compassion, his mercy. You read the Bible every day and you will know Jesus. All right? Okay. The wonderful works of Jesus Christ made him a point of interest. The miracles we see, the testimonies we hear, that gives us a point of interest. How do we apply it in our lives? We have to come to Jesus. It's very simple. The minute you say, Lord Jesus, is there. You don't need to do anything. You know, it's very, very simple religion, you know. All the people are seeking to go to a particular place, a particular time, a particular food, a particular dress and all that to seek their God. For us, he says, I stand at the door of your heart. I knock and you open, I mean, all you have to do is, Lord, come into my life. And he is in your life. And you believe so. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17. If you believe in your heart, he is already residing. You have to believe, that's all. So, God is with us all the time. Even during our troubled times. You may not have money. You may not have a house. You may not have a car. You may not have help. But still God is with you the minute you call on him. Call on me during your troubled time. I will answer you. That's the promise of Jesus Christ. Jesus was walking towards Jairus' house now. And suddenly there was a disruption of the journey. This woman, I want to tell you something about this woman. She had a period flowing non-stop for 12 years. As a doctor, I know when you have a flowing period for 12 years, number one, you become anemic. Number two, when you become anemic, you be, you'll become very weak. Your heart weakens. Your kidney starts to fail. You are on the verge of death. Because many people, you know, when they read this, how did she know the period has stopped? Hey, my friend, she was panting, she can't even walk, she can't even do it because of her low oxygen in her body. For 12 years she's been bleeding and 12 years of bleeding would have drained her blood out totally. And the minute she touched the garment of Jesus Christ, she became well. Her heart started working, she had energy, she had power, everything she had. That's why she knew. And because she was a Jewish woman, because she is a Jewish woman, and because she had bleeding, she cannot go to the synagogue. She is ceremoniously unclean. Nobody will touch her. Nobody can go. And the Bible says that she has spent all her money on the doctors and they couldn't heal her. 
and she is in desperation. She has lost everything. The only thing that awaits her is the grave. That's the only thing that awaits. Many of us, we are in that type of situation. We pray for death. So at least I die better. I no need to suffer this. This suffer the pain, suffer the isolation, suffer the humiliation, suffer the poverty. No, I better die. She was in that position. Jesus stopped. He did not go away. Jesus stopped. Of course, he knew. He's omniscient. He knew that somebody has touched in faith, his garment, and that person is here, made well. Jesus could have gone on. What is there? Nothing. Okay, now she touched me. She's healed. Okay, good. No. He stopped and asked to touch me. I think the disciples of us have been very angry with him. And they told him so. Not only angry, they told him, what are you talking? There are so many people around you, milling you around. So many could have touched. What are you asking? Who touched my garment? When you line up, you know, for your coffee fellowship, you somebody touch you, you cannot turn around us. There are so many of us there. There are so many people around there. Jesus said, I know the power has gone out from me. She knew that immediately that she cannot hide it. So she came in fear and fell. And the loving hands of Jesus touched her and said, daughter, call her daughter. The Lord calls you as his own. I am the good shepherd. You are special to Jesus. You are special. Jesus loved that woman as he as father loves the daughter. You know, somehow, those of us who have daughters and sons, we, the fathers tend to love the daughters more. The mothers tend to love the sons more. It's it's in all cultures. If you are a father, you have a daughter, you know how affectionate they are to you. I know one guy is knocking his head and say, yes, yes, I have only one daughter. And her name was not with him. You know, it's very surprisingly, Mark did not write the woman's name. Whenever you find the woman, person's name is not mentioned, it includes you and me. You put your name. You put your name. When a name is not mentioned in goodness or bad, it is your name. Place yourself in that person's and look at it that way the woman had looked at it. That's the application. We are unclean people. Isaiah cried out when he saw the vision of God sitting in the temple. And he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live with people with unclean. We are not pure. You know, we can have good bath, apply everything. Like my professor used to say, remember that you carry feces shit with you all that place where you go. It's inside here. You're unclean. We are unclean. Spiritually, we are unclean because of the wicked thoughts, vain thoughts, evil thoughts, envious thoughts, bad thoughts, all types of thoughts. We are unclean. But this did not reject us. He did not reject us. He accepted us. That is his grace. He accepted us. Either you accept him or not, he has accepted us. And he was willing to die for us. He died for the whole world, not only for you and me. We are blessed because we realized and we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior. But before that, he accepted us. Even before the foundation of the world. That's the topic that we are looking at that moment. God is not slow to save. Now, the word came, 
to Jairus in the year. Jairus, don't bother. Your daughter died already. Finish. Story should have to should have close. Jesus told Jairus, be of good cheer. We have the faith. You came with a necessity faith. Hold on to that faith. You will see a miracle. And Jesus entered. And he said, why, why, why are you all crying here? The girl is just sleeping. The girl is just sleeping. I'll wake her up. They all mocked him. They all mocked him. And then, and then, you know, I want to tell you an incident. It happened to me also, but another patient, they rang up and the doctor came and even stopped the car engine on, ran into my clinic and said, my father is dying, please come, come, come. Anyway, I those days I used to carry my bag and I used to have that story. When there, I touched him, he scolded. Then I say, is your father diabetic? Yes. He immediately opened the dextrose and poured into his mouth. A few minutes later, he opened his eyes. They are still with me, the patient. The patient passed away a few years ago. But the children and the grandchildren still come to me all the way. And uh, they say, oh, you, oh, you did a miracle. Oh, my. A simple fact is I knew his lack of sugar is fainted. I put in the sugar, he will be all right. The Lord knows he can do for us. He knows that death is nothing. It's a sleep. He will bring us back to life. The resurrection is a certainty. Not, I'm not talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about yours and my resurrection. He will raise us up. We have that hope. And that is called the blessed hope. So, he used the word talita. Kumi. You could have written, actually, if it not, the writer could have easily said, he told the girl, hold the hand and say, rise up, little girl, and she rose. But he used that Aramaic word which Jesus spoke. Tali Takumi. That means, come from death to life. There's entirely a different meaning now. Though the translation says, Christ, little girl, actually the meaning is, come to life from death. This morning, that is the call for you. Come to life. Come to life from death. John's Gospel, chapter 14. I am the life. Nobody ever claimed it except Jesus Christ. I am life. Come to me. Shall we pray? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for teaching us this morning. You are life. You are the healer. You are the kindest and gracious person ever walked on this earth. That we are blessed to be your children. You have the power to heal us, the power to raise us, the power to reconstruct us. We thank you and praise you for this gospel. We thank you, Lord, for teaching us. In the name of Jesus, we pray.